Hey, it's Wilmer Valderrama from Essential Voices with Wilmer Valderrama Podcast. This clip is brought to you by State Farm. At State Farm, we know what it takes to manage money, no matter what the budget. That's why it's a good idea to consider State Farm. Why? Because State Farm offers everyone surprisingly great rates. Como un buen vecino, State Farm está ahí. Sometimes at home, we might not have the understanding or the comprehension we may need. And for that, there is incredible uh, souls like you, uh, Dr. Kavner, who is willing to listen and go the extra mile to make us feel heard, make us feel comprehended, and make us feel normal. Listen to Essential Voices with me, Wilmer Valderrama, every Tuesday as part of the My Cultura Podcast Network, available on iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Good afternoon. Would you like to try a free sample of our double fudge brownie? Oh, sure. Mmm, that's very good. I I'll just take one more, just to be sure. Yep, still very good. Some things never change, like never being able to take just one free sample. And Geico saving folks lots of money on their car insurance. Mmm, is that macadamia nut I taste? Let me take one more. Sir, mm. yeah. I thought so. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. To show you how easy it is to file a claim with GEICO, we hired a soap opera star. Gracious me, my car has storm damage and I've had to file a claim. Could it possibly get worse? Will my claims team leave me for someone else? Someone less intense? Um, no. Actually, when you file a claim with GEICO, you get your own dedicated claims team who promises to stay with you throughout the process. Oh, I've never known such loyalty. I can't wait for the second season. Geico, great service without all the drama. Hey guys, welcome for tuning in to this edition of Free Thinking with Montel. I'm so excited to have my guest on that I have on the show tonight. But before I introduce her, I want to tell you a little bit about what our conversations are. You know, I've had a lot of people who have and are really true survivors of the same illness that I have that afflicts so many people around the world, uh, MS. And, you know, I've got a documentarian that's going to come on in a little bit to talk about a new documentary that I think all of you out there who know someone with MS or have MS yourself should take a look at. But before we talk about that, I think one of the things that I'd like to touch on is something that, that I've been a huge proponent of since my diagnosis and before, and that is making sure that, you know, I alone own the definition of who I am. And what I mean by that is that when I got diagnosed with MS, it was one of those shocking moments in a doctor's office where the guy literally almost nonchalantly said something to me about, oh, I think you definitely have MS. And oh, by the way, you'll probably be in a wheelchair in about five to six, five to 10 years. And I was like, I looked at him like I wanted to smack him upside his head. Like, how the heck do you, can you put a crystal ball out there when Last time I looked, you know, doctors weren't magicians and nor were they God. So how can you predict what's going to happen to me? But it caught me off guard because he didn't know me before I walked in that office. And now based on something that he read in a book, he was going to turn around and tell me what my life outcome would be. Not giving me an opportunity to even consider there might be something that I could do that might impact the progression of my illness, or at least help me slow down the progression of my illness. He said nothing like that. So the first thing that I did that was really, I think the most important thing that I did was that after I got over the sullen shock and the depression over the words that came out of his mouth, I then, and fortunately, the internet was just now becoming robust. This was in 2000. And I jumped into the internet and jumped into the library and started digging as deeply as I could to see if I could learn as much as I could about my illness. And what I found out literally shocked me. Um, as much as, you know, some most of the prognoses that were available from doctor's mouths and doctor's journals painted this, you know, dire next five to 10 years of my life. I also saw some literature talking about how just basic lifestyle changes could impact my life, not just with MS, but my life in million, a myriad of different ways. And so, you know, I set upon a journey and decided to try to learn as much as I could learn and then share as much as I learned with everybody I come in contact with 
especially those in the MS community, about the fact that the truth is, if doctors were gods, none of us would be sick. Well, the fact of the matter is they're not gods. So that's why, you know, they don't have all the answers. But we need to at least have enough answers to know how to ask the right questions. And so I started digging into the power of lifestyle choices and changes that I can make. I changed my diet. I changed the way I exercise. I changed the way I meditated. I started meditating. I changed almost every aspect of my life. And rather than immediately succumb to my illness, I started noticing that what I thought was going to be this immediate progressive um, outcome started slowing down a little bit. And then I started actually regaining some of the faculties that I thought that I had lost. And though, yes, there's no question, you know, here it is 21 years later, I have MS. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. I have the disease. I know I have it. I feel something about it every single day of my life. It's like that, you know, good witch, bad witch, or good, you know, gremlin, bad gremlin, and another little asshole on my shoulder every day whispering in my ear, oh, hey, you know what? You got MS. Okay, I get it. I got it. However, at the same time, as I continue to look for those things that could help mitigate or slow down the progression of the illness and started applying them to my daily life, I noticed that it started working. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to work for everyone. But the power of the choice of making a decision to change my life was as powerful as anything that any Western regiment that I'm on, any Eastern regiment regiment that I'm on, any you know futuristic regiment that I'm on. It's the fact that I alone will define who I am with this illness until my last breath. And you know, okay, if the disease decides that it's time to start progressing with me, then you know what? I'll face that head on and figure out ways that I can maximize the part of me that's still here that hasn't been taken away by this disease. I've said it since day one. I have MS. MS will never have me. It may affect me, but as long as I approach it from the standpoint that not a glass is half full, but I approach it from the standpoint of I'm still here. I still have the ability. I'm still thinking. I'm still exercising. I'm still eating right. I'm still loving right. I'm still have my ability to help and other people you know, life's good. And so I could focus in on all of the, oh, woe is me aspects of the illness, or I can literally champion all those things that I know I feel better about and help communicate that with as many people as I possibly can. And that's what I'm so happy about being able to do this podcast, Free Thinking, because it allows me to bring on people who have other initiatives and other ideas about how to approach the same topic with the thought in mind that they are just here to help others. And so what am I saying? I mean, you know, we talk about what's going on right now when it comes to global warming. You know, we want everybody to take responsibility for their carbon footprint. We want businesses to take responsibility for their carbon footprint. You hear it all the time. We want nations to take responsibility for their carbon footprint. But we're also looking at a time right now in the world where And I am not, by any sense of the word, a science naysayer, but science has only gotten us but so far. And there's so much more out there that we could all be doing if we just took the time to take responsibility for our own health care footprint. I mean, here in the United States, we're talking about the prices skyrocketing every single day for medicine and for hospitalization and for doctor's visits. Well, you know what? Let me tell you something. I'm seeing a doctor right now, really, honestly, once a year for my annual physical. Um, Most people with MS are seeing doctors anywhere from 10 to 15 to 20 times a year. Uh, But I'm seeing one once a year. Why? Because I try my damnedest to take responsibility for my health care footprint and do all the things that I can do to help mitigate some of my symptoms, but also help keep me from falling ill to other things. I mean, 
you know, we look at, you know, this pandemic that has hit the world. We know that people who are obese or out of shape and have not exercised for long periods of time are having some of the toughest consequences when they go in the hospitals. We know that, you know, a large percentage of those who have, are now worldwide victims that have passed away from this pandemic were not in the best health before they got it to begin with. You know, that's not taking responsibility for your healthcare footprint. We alone are the directors of our future if we were to just put as much time as we put into complaining about our plight, we put in that same amount of time trying to impact our plight. And, you know, that's why I think it was so important that I have this guest on that I have today. And we, you know, you'll know who the guest is did a documentary about because she's been on my show now twice on free thinking and has impacted thousands of lives around the world. Those who are willing enough to just absorb the information, understand that this is not a regimen as much as it is a lifestyle choice that they can individually make to impact their own modality than what may be happening. So today we're going to showcase a very important documentary on the topic of defying all odds. I want you to take a little look at this. I was really struggling with picking up my left leg. And it was very clear that something was very wrong. saw a neurologist and then he said, well, this could be bad or it could be really, really bad. Taking the newest drugs from the best people uh, here in the U.S. was not stopping my decline towards a bedridden, possibly demented, possibly uncontrolled horrific pain. I did not expect to recover. For years, I thought it was genes were the biggest risk factor, diagnose people quickly, treat them with drugs. That's the conventional medicine. What I really should have been doing was focusing on uh, the environmental factors and addressing those. I am the canary in the coal mine. Well, my guest today is award-winning writer, producer, director. She recently completed her second documentary feature, Defying All Oz. The doc has already garnered the Critics' Choice Awards at the Iowa Independent Film Festival, Best Director Documentary Feature at the Culver City Film Festival, and an Award of Merit Special Mention at the Impact Docs Awards in La Jolla. Caroline Moise, thank you so much for joining me today on Free Thinking with Montel, all the way from Australia, by the way. So thank you so much for being a part of today's show. Hi, Montel. Thank you so much for having me. I must say I feel quite grateful to be on your show. I used to watch uh, your talk show when I was younger. So, <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you very much for making me feel so old, though. I'm only kidding. No, thank you. Thank you so much. And, you know, I, I, I hear that a lot, and I hear that from a lot of people who come to me and say to me that, you know, Mine was one of the only talk shows that their parents allowed them to watch uh, when they came home from school. And, you know, I felt very honored to be invited in the people's living rooms the way I had been for the time and length of time that I had been. So thank you for watching. You're welcome. Absolutely. Now, you decided to do a documentary on a guest that has, has been really a phenom on my podcast, Dr. Terry Walls. On um, You did a documentary on her. Uh, that shows uh, that, and she's been on the show a couple of times, but her story and her dedication to research, to support of her work is very inspiring. How did you decide that this was going to be the story that you wanted to tell for your second project? Um, so people who've been following Dr. Walls may already notice because I, I did um, talk about it in the past um, about how I came about making the film on her 
But basically, I was making a first film. It was my debut as a feature documentary on the paleo diet. And someone pointed out uh, to me um, at the time, Kane Credicott, who's uh, the editor of the Paleo magazine, he said, you should look into Dr. Terry Wall's story. You should have her in your movie. And so I looked her up and I thought, wow, it's phenomenal. This woman has achieved so much uh, being an MS, um, you know, victim herself or survivor. So I thought, hmm, the only thing is that I feel her story is so rich that it deserves its own film. And I already had all my participants for my first film. So I put it at the back of my mind, made my first film. And when I was done with that, I asked um, a friend that we have in common, Daryl Edwards, to connect us. And he did. And um, I asked her, I said, look, I think, you know, there's a lot of uh, stuff about you online, but you're in your interviews. You are mostly seen as you know the expert you you've got your lab coat on and you're talking as an md but there's not m many stories about your life and your your recovery journey so to speak and i said it'd be lovely to have a film uh, about that and she was quite you know interested and you know wanted to hear more about my concept and so i you know told her I had a vision, I, I knew, you know, I kind of had a strong idea about how I wanted to uh, carry out this documentary, uh, stylistically, visually, content wise as well. And um, we, you know, went back and forth emailing and talking and, you know, developing the idea. And um, this is a story I've never told actually Montel. So your uh, listeners are gonna be the first to hear this. I actually did a proof of concept for her and nothing. I did not hear back. Oh, no. Emails, phone calls. I, I couldn't reach her. And you're thinking, uh-oh, uh-oh, what did I do wrong, right? Exactly. And I was like, you know, feeling a bit down because I was like, wow, such a shame. You know, I think this could have been amazing. And didn't hear for months, so I picked up another concept because um, I wanted to make a second film. So I picked up another concept, and that was going wrong the whole way through. Like people were saying, "Yes, I'm, I'll participate," and then they they wouldn't anymore. They wouldn't be available. Things weren't working out for this concept, and I was like, "Wow!" One day I sat down and I just went, "You know what? I'm just gonna let go." I'm going to let go of that project. I'm going to detach. What will be, will be. And I remember looking up and saying, just show me what's my next step. What am I, what am I supposed to make? Literally, I said that to myself and just went into full detachment mode. Well, could you believe me if I told you that not less like I, th I think it was about an hour later i got an email from dr walls wow i was shocked because it had been months and months and she said caroline i'm so very sorry i actually had um back surgery so she explained that it wasn't ms related but she did have to get this surgery on her back so she would she was out of commission for a few months and she's like i am still interested can we pick up where we left off. And that's what we did. But I found it so amazing that the minute I decided to let go and just, you know, let go of all resistance, there she was again. Wow, that's amazing. And, you know, you use some really unbelievable creative techniques, like you use creative animation, you know, to help tell some of her scientific talking points. And you also use re reenactments to help tell a story. Um, was this the first time you had tried that kind of compilation of, you know, techniques to tell your story? It was, it was, it was a total leap of faith because I had seen a couple documentaries that had those various elements and I thought, you know, put together, I think they could look quite good. Mm -hmm. So, um, the animation concept of, you know, Dr. Walls talking and then describing things with, with her hands and, mm -hmm doing gestures and us animating that 
Um, that came from seeing The Immortalist, um, which was a great feature documentary that uh, went um, to South by Southwest and won uh, a prize. And I was like, wow, this is a great idea because sometimes you're describing completely abstract concepts. And if you don't have visuals for it, it's quite hard to keep the uh, audience engaged. Right. So I was like, okay, we'll, we'll take that. And then I'd seen a documentary um, with this uh, amazing uh, philosopher and economist, and um, he was alone in the doc documentary throughout. I was like, okay, so we could do that with Dr. Walls. We could have her be the only uh, interview subject because uh, I think she's entertaining enough for that and she's got lots to say. So let's just make this the backbone of the film. Um, and the film that I was uh, referring to a minute ago was uh, Requiem for an American Dream. And that's uh, with Noam Chomsky. I can never say his name right, but uh, mm. that was the inspiration for having Dr. Walls um, be the only interview subject. And, and then you fill that in with the reenactments, right? Exactly. Reenactments, because when I was speaking with uh, Dr. Walls, I said, look, how much archival footage, uh, archival media do you have? And she said to me, not very much, because obviously being in a wheelchair sick, I didn't I did not like the situation for myself. I didn't like myself at that time. So obviously, you know, it wasn't a happy time. So we didn't take many pictures, many videos. And I was like, well, you know what, then we'll have to recreate those scenes um, so that the audience can really um, be immersed in, you know, that journey of yours. And that turned out to be, to do quite well, actually, quite well. Despite the small budget, we pulled it off. Oh, you did a really nice job of that. Absolutely. And, and you know, now, I mean, you look at your first film, which we love, Paleo, you know, yeah, talk a little bit about your passion for telling stories that are focused on the connection between, let's say, food choices that we make and and our health. Well, I um, I think I, I, I you could say that I've tried pretty much everything under the sun when it comes to uh, diets and dietary templates. And so I uh, used to train a lot when I was in my twenties. I was a fencer, so I love fencing, and I was. Um, fencing quite a bit, uh, 30 hours per week, because I was also competing. And my coach would tell me to, he gave me a diet. He said, look, this is what you got to eat. You'll be so healthy. You'll be so strong. You'll, you'll win all the medals. And, and eating that stuff did not make me feel any better. If anything, it made me feel worse. Um, yeah. You know, bloated. I, I didn't, I didn't sleep well. I had all these little ailments. And um, the diet consisted of mainly rice, legumes, lots of it, and wheat and dairy, of course. I, I ate dairy, a lot of it. And um, I was wondering, why is that? Many years later, because I was like my coach, I, you know, I'll just trust the coach, right? So I was doing what he said uh, that I should do. But many years later, I started looking into why I wasn't feeling our podcast, Red Table Talk, The Estefans, is all about my family and sharing our stories with nuestra comunidad. And what's great about T-Mobile is that it allows you to stay connected with both because they have the Magenta Max plan, the first one designed specifically for 5G usage with unlimited premium data so you can stay in touch with your family and share all your latest pics, videos, and posts on the go at super fast speeds. And speaking of La Familia, part of what we do to stay close is to enjoy watching our favorite shows and movies together in English and Spanish on Netflix. And T-Mobile's Magenta Max includes a Netflix subscription. And they don't stop there. The taxes and fees are already included. So the price you see is the price you pay. If you love staying connected with your loved ones and your community, go with T-Mobile. Visit a T-Mobile store or go to es.t-mobile.com today.
Unlimited on our network. Activate up to 4K UHD streaming on capable device. Or video typically streams at 480p. Up to 40 gigabit high-speed tethering than max 3G speeds. Receive Netflix standard two-screen HD up to a $12.99 per month value. With two plus max lines. Sales tax and regulatory fees included in monthly rate plan price. See 5G device, coverage, and access details at T-Mobile.com. Hey, it's Wilmer Valderrama from Essential Voices of Wilmer Valderrama Podcast. This clip is brought to you by State Farm. At State Farm, we know what it takes to manage money, no matter what the budget. That's why when it comes to taking care of what we love most in the way we want, it's a good idea to consider State Farm. Why? Because State Farm offers everyone surprisingly great rates on car insurance. If you need to insure your car, don't hesitate to talk to a State Farm agent and take a look at solutions that match your needs. It's easy. Como un buen vecino. State Farm está ahí. I was just arriving from Venezuela back in 1993. At the end of 1993, I was 13 years old. And I had to repeat the seventh grade because I didn't know how to speak English. So I was in ESL classes, English as a second language. And that was the class where I had, you know, I was able to commute with other kids like me that had just gotten here too. You know, and as I was progressing through school, you know, I, I realized that my first job on behalf of my family was to learn how to speak English. You know, that was the first thing I needed to do. And as it progressed, I had a couple of teachers who, you know, who really believed, right? Who really believed in these kids, you know? And I think that that was one of the biggest sound of confidence that really kind of empowered me to do what I'm doing now. Listen to Essential Voices with me, Wilmer Valderrama, every Tuesday as part of the My Cultura Podcast Network, available on iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. What up? It's Dramos. You may know me from the recap on LA TV. Now I've got my own podcast, Life as a Gringo, coming to you every Tuesday and Thursday. We'll be talking real and unapologetic about all things life, Latin culture, and everything in between from someone who's never quite fit in. Listen to Life as a Gringo on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your podcasts. Brought to you by State Farm. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Good, no matter what I ate. Uh, as soon as I ate anything that was like a grain, boom, you know, those ailments would reappear. And so I thought to myself, there must be a better way. And um, I decided, why not go vegan? And I'll try that. But I know that grains make me a bit, um, you know, ill. So I'll go raw vegan. <laughs> So I did, but that didn't last more than, I think, two months because it's it was unsustainable. I felt tired all the time. I felt like I wanted protein. Um, and then protein was eating soy, but then, you know, you can't really, you know, you've got to either it was like drinking soy milk or it, it just wasn't working. It was, to me, completely unsustainable. I was always hungry, feeling tired. And then looked into it some more, I decided, okay, this doesn't work for me. Let's try something else. And that's how I came across the paleo diet. And as soon as I read about it, its tenants, the principles, I was like, it resonated with me. I was like, wow, it feels like this is probably what I need. And Montel, as soon as I started that, everything changed. Everything turned around for me. The bloating went away. I was sleeping better. I had no more uh, IBS symptoms. It was just phenomenal and I felt better. And it, I think, you know, people were seeing me in the streets and saying, Hey, what are you doing? You look amazing. I was like, well, mm. I started following the paleo diet and I feel quite awesome. That's and, unbelievable. and that's, that's how I was, you know, compelled to share over and over with people when I meet them in the street and whatnot, or, you know, I'd be at, at, at a social event and, tell them about, you know, what I was doing. At some point I thought, you know what? Why not make a documentary about this? Got it. Got it. And then of course you hear about Dr. Walls and realize that here's a prime example of someone who is living the message. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, now what was one of the most important things that you wanted to tell in telling Dr. Walls' story? Um, it was important for me to have her tell a story in an emotional way, have us tell a story in a way that would resonate with people. 
I didn't want them to see her just like, oh, okay, I've seen Dr. Walls in this, that, and that other interview, and it, I know what she's going to talk about. I wanted her to tell her story in a fresh new way. That was very important for me because, you know, um, when you're interviewed over and over, and she's done dozens of interviews by now, uh, you become accustomed to the way you actually um, recount your journey. And I thought, well, we need this film to feel fresh. So uh, the questions were tailored to that end. So I asked questions that, you know, she hadn't been asked many times before or, you know, never really um, extrapolated on. So that was at the core, you know, it, it needed to be emotional and it needed to be fresh. Well, did you, did, were you shooting this during COVID or did you have all your shooting done before COVID broke out? Before, that was in 2018, actually. Okay. okay, gotcha. But now you were editing through the beginning of COVID, right? Um, n- no. Uh, okay. So basically, we shot in 2018 and I, start, and I edited in 2019 uh, all the way through to um, 2020. And we released the film in October 2020. Gotcha. So you got it out right as the pandemic broke. Exactly. And everyone was saying it's the perfect time to release a new um, documentary on the on the subject because, you know, everyone is looking for answers. Right. And, you know, I, 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 I'm just wondering, like, what has been the response? It's been amazing. People are um, not a week goes by without people reaching out via email and saying, thank you so much for making this film. Um, Dr. Walls is amazing. She's changed so many lives. and um, She's such a beacon of light. And I believe that too. I'm like, we need more people like her. And she's an amazing storyteller as well. So I was, I'm just really happy when I get these emails, obviously, because it means that I'm helping spreading her message. And um, that makes my day, to be honest. Hmm. No, you know, again, it, we're looking at a time right now where the world still is faced with this huge pandemic. And we have People, including myself, I will tell you that I've not been as strict as I should have been during this whole period of time and living and being isolated in my own home. You know, I made some some choices when I made them. And I live with them and now I'm moving on from them. Um, but why is it so important right now more than ever for a film like this? Well, um, like Louis Pasteur said, I don't know if uh, you know what he said on his deathbed, uh, the French um, microbiologist said, you know, germ is nothing, terrain is everything. Because he realized that our immune system and how strong the immune system is, is at the end of the day, what counts. So obviously with the pandemic, um, there's an even greater motivation to really make sure that our immune system is strong enough to withstand whatever attack comes from the outside. So it's, I think, the perfect time for people to look into, you know, how can I improve my health? How can I um, make sure that I'm resilient enough? You know, I'll never forget that one of the first interviews I did back in 2020, right after I had been diagnosed, I went on a webcast. It wasn't a webcast. I went on a a radio interview, and I literally talked to, I was talking to was another doctor on the panel with me, a doc, not another, a doctor was on the panel with me. And I, you know, went off on, because I had just started digging in deep for myself. And this is back in 2020, I was saying, you know, I really need to pay closer attention to my immune system because uh, since this is what they call an autoimmune disease, I need to make sure that my immune system is operating at 100% the right way. And so there's some things that I need to do. And this doctor literally, you know, jumped down my throat a little bit and Mm -hmm. said, you shouldn't think things like that. And I was like, we got in a little bit of an argument on uh, on air, which ended ended with him saying, well, you can't just say things like that to people because, you know, people will take the wrong impression. I said, well, slow down, dude. Why are you so nervous? And I still find it now that, you know, there is such pushback out there as much as there has been lots of, you know, zealots who have now come to the table and 
seeing your documentary. So many more need to because, you know, there's a lot of pushback in the medical community about some of the things that Dr. Walls talks about. Because, you know, there are doctors who make more money off of trying to make sure that they can sell as many pharmaceuticals as they can. Absolutely. And it, it, it just, I mean, have you found and, and heard a lot of pushbacks and, oh, no, she wasn't right. Why did you do this? Why did you put this information out there? Have you heard anything like that? So far, so good. Not that much, actually. I know that Dr. Walls has experienced a lot of pushback as she was developing the protocol and still now. Um, but I personally haven't, um, so far, I think the people contacting me are people that are generally, um, happy that I made the film. So that's good, I guess. But yes, there, there, there is always, um, you know, there are always going to be naysayers. Uh, there are people that have vested interest in us taking pills. And Absolutely. That's a- that's unfortunate, but this is also why it was so important for me on our film poster, you know, the slogan of the film. Yes, the title is Defying All Odds, which I thought describes very much so what Dr. Walls went through, but the slogan is the power of healing lies within you. And that's a sentence that comes from Dr. Walls' um, book, The Walls Protocol. And when I read that, reading her book, I was like, that's, that's the essence of it right there. Right. We right. are in charge of our own health. Yeah. Um, you know, our health you is our And, and um, that's another reason why it was completely um, crucial for me to make the film is uh, I wanted to show people how it could be done. I wanted them to feel empowered. You know, now you're probably getting ready to start your third film or move on to the next project. But I mean, what are some of the challenges in documentary films today versus, let's say, four or five years ago? Because, I mean, I think, you know, with what I've kind of found in the medium of the media is that we've all gotten so caught up in, you know, wanting to have either something confrontational or a battle and a battle with only a little bit of information because if you give too much information, then you overwhelm the viewer. What's the challenge right now in trying to make a documentary film that you know people will gravitate to and want to see? I think the biggest challenge is how do we keep people engaged? Because we're, you know, nowadays with um, the interwebs, like I like to call it, um, people are constantly, you know, there's always something vying for our attention. And basically attention spans, uh, studies have shown that attention spans are becoming shorter and shorter. So basically, how do we make a film that will be, will have that hook, hook people in, Um, and make them want to watch the rest of the film because I know that I have important information for them and I'd like to educate them on certain things. But to do that, you can't put people to sleep, obviously, right from, you know, at the start of your film, you got to, you know, make sure that you tell your story in a compelling way because, um, you know, once the, the, you know, you have a finished product, um, You'll also have a lot of noise out there, a lot of other films competing on streamers and whatnot. And people have only, you know, we only have so much, so much time in in a day. So basically it's twofold. It's like making it, making it engaging enough for them to want to watch it. Um, And it's not always that obvious when the topic is, you know, autoimmune and um, health, you know, those um, are a bit more, you know, in the film, we, we went into detail with, you know, autoimmunity and how the body works. And sometimes, you know, it's not that easy to make these subjects interesting, which is also why I thought, well, great, we're going to marry both things, the science and her journey. And that should engage people from, from the start. Um, and then, you know, like I said, making the film after that, it's like, wow, okay, well, there are thousands of other movies out there. How do we make sure that this one gets seen? Gotcha. And now how many languages is the film in now? Well, um, we now have German subtitles, 
Spanish subtitles and very recently French subtitles, which makes me very happy because it also means that my family back in Montreal can, uh, they don't speak much English, so they can now actually watch my film. That's great. That's we're, so we're also, I should add, Montel, that we are, uh, I've been asked, people have reached out to me asking for me to make um, the next language uh, be Portuguese. Wow. Because uh, in Brazil, apparently the situation is a bit dire when it comes to, you know, um, the population's health. And uh, some people have said, please make the next language Portuguese, because I think it could really help people down here. Absolutely. That's unbelievable. And now people wanted to have access to it and see it. Where do they go? So they can go to Defying All Odds Movie. So all in one word, defyingalloddsmovie.com. And then they just uh, can click on the tab called Watch. Okay. Just defyingalloddsmovie.com. Click on the tab, Watch. And if people wanted to reach out to you, where would they go? Social media. Um, they can actually just simply subscribe to uh, the newsletter on the same website. And there's a field there and they can type in any question they want. And um, then I can, you know, reply to them like that. There's also, you know, we have social media channel uh, channels, so they can reach me through there as well. Instagram is at we love paleo and um, Facebook. We have a dedicated Facebook page for the film, which is um, facebook.com slash uh, defying all odds. And I wanted to say as well, Montel, that um, for anyone wanting a discount on the film, we do have one for your listeners. Oh, wow. Thank you. You're welcome. So it's Montel underscore DAO 2021. So Montel underscore DAO 2021. So if they type this in the checkout box, they'll be able to have the film for um, nearly half price. My goodness, everybody I think who's listening in and tuning in right now is probably going to go up on there and try to pull, pull that down for you. So thank you so much for, for giving a gift to uh, my viewers and listeners. I sure and, hope so. Welcome. Yeah, and I hope that they do do that. I can't thank you enough for being a part of Free Thinking with Mont Holiday. And, you know, how is it in Australia right now? How are you guys dealing with the uh, COVID? Is it is it well, coming under control? We just reopened uh, last week. So um, slowly... But surely things are reopening. We uh, reopened after 106 days of hard lockdown. So it, it was a tough time, I think, um, down in, uh, in New South Wales, which is the state where Sydney is. And also Victoria is going through a tough time at the moment. Uh, Melbourne is under full lockdown and they will be probably for the next few months. But here in Sydney, things are, are getting back to, you know, the new normal, as they call it. And are people, are you, do you have vaccinations there or, or is it just because it's run its course? Uh, no, we, um, the politicians um, down here have decided that at 70% we would reopen and that we hit that mark last week. And when we hit 80%, more freedoms will be um, given back to us, let's say. And um, that, that includes uh, no more mask wearing indoors and outdoors. So. People are looking forward to it. But at the, at the very least right now, people can actually go to restaurants and, and have a meal with friends. And, and that's something that we haven't done for so long. So everyone's quite excited. So, but again, people are at least trying to take responsibility for their own healthcare footprint, still masking and doing the appropriate things and trying to get that number up to 80%, right? Absolutely. And we're very close to 80%, actually. Very close. I think it's uh, we're missing a point or two to reach it. So well, it's, it's, it's good news. Well, bless you. And thank you for doing this movie. I really, really, really do appreciate it. I loved it. I watched it. It was really incredible. And I'll tell us to, to all of our viewers out there, this is definitely a film worth watching um, without a doubt, just for the sheer nature of the inspiration behind the science. It's not just about the science. It's the inspiration behind the science. And so um, I really got to say, thank you for being a part of the show, uh, Caroline. Um, you know, I'd love to have you back. Uh, you should let us know what your next project's going to be. And, um, you know, when you get it done, come on back and uh, we'll, we'll have you on again. Thanks for having me, Montel. Really, I, I feel very grateful um, to be on your show. So thanks again. And please continue your great work. More power to you. Thank you so much. And you guys out there, you've been tuned in. Keep tuning in. Keep watching. We've got more great information coming your way on Free Thank You with Montel. We'll see you next time. 
Thanks for joining me on 3 Thinking with Montel. Please make sure you're subscribed and hit the bell to be notified when new episodes post each week. We'd love to hear your feedback, so please send us your comments. What up? It's Dramos. You may know me from the recap on LA TV. Now I've got my own podcast, Life as a Gringo, coming to you every Tuesday and Thursday. We'll be talking real and unapologetic about all things life, Latin culture, and everything in between from someone who's never quite fit in. Listen to Life as a Gringo on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your podcasts. Brought to you by State Farm. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Ice-T. I want you to do something for me. Make sure you download and subscribe Library Rap, the hip-hop interviews with Tim I and Cal. It is official. All right? Stop playing. Download and subscribe. Library Rap, the hip-hop interviews with Tim I and Cal. It's cold. Yeah. Hey, what's up, y'all? Tim Ironico does one of the best interviews in all hip-hop and rap music. I'm Chuck D for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame group Public Enemy to tell you he brings the noise. I think it's very important to know the artist. Like when you take Biz, for example, the stuff I wrote for Biz was in Biz style. The artist changes and grows and evolves. I wouldn't want to go back and change anything. Listen to Library Rap, the hip-hop interviews with Tim Einenkel on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.